The word of Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's hard when to say thank you for, isn't it? Because that's one of those judgment passages, if you didn't know that. It is about judgment. Now, when I asked you if you had talents, you all sat there like, I can't say that, because I've been told that it's, I can't brag about the things I do well, right? But how many of you heard this passage maybe growing up with a sermon attached to it that said, whatever you do well, give it to God, which means that Milt would be up here singing or that I would be up here playing my flute. That was what I heard one year. If you, if you know how to do something, you had to do it in church. So I played my flute in church and nobody was blessed. Even God turned off the sound for that one. But we can say that, can't we, and just say, oh, that's nice, it's over with, I can go home now. But this is one of those passages that's the toughest to understand in all of Scripture because this is a story about God and God's people. And God is a sort of taskmaster here, right? And God is the master and the owner of slaves. Slavery is a tough word for us, isn't it? It's a tough word for anybody. How much money did a slave make back in the day? They didn't make any money. They were property. And we don't like to think about the taskmaster and the slaves and the response, especially of the one who returned nothing on the investment. So we've got to take some time and look at what this really means for us. Now, a talent was not just a sum of money. It was a measurement. It was a weight, actually. And later, it became sort of um, attached to a certain amount of money. Do you know how much one talent would be? The average of 20 years of a laborer's wages. So if you want to take my salary, that would be a million and a half dollars over 20 years. A million and a half dollars. I don't make that in a year. You all know that, right? I'm not complaining about my salary, but that would be 20 years of my salary would be a million and a half dollars. So the one who got a little bit got a lot. So what's it saying that God is giving us? Is God going to give everybody a million and a half dollars? No. And if if I were a slave and uh, my owner handed me a million and a half dollars and said, I'll be back someday, I would be on the road the next minute. I would be gone with that money in my pocket. But they stay and they work. And the one with the five talents five times 20 years salary, that's a lot of money there, doubles the money. The second one, who's only been given two, and remember, he gave them each as they had the ability to do things with, gave back double what he had been given. But the other one was afraid and hid it in the ground. Now, it would be easy just to say, don't hide your talents from us, right? If you sing, sing, come up here and sing. If you play the flute, even if you don't play it very well, come up here and play the flute. Or if you make good chili or you know how to fix things, do that for the church. Those are all worthy things, certainly worthy things to do. But it's about more than that, isn't it? It's about the fullness of life that we've been called to give to God. It's really a recognition, isn't it, that everything we have is God's to begin with. I say it, and I say it often. It's easier to say Jesus is Lord than to say Jesus is Lord of my life. If we say Jesus is Lord of all things, everybody can shout, amen, hallelujah, right? But if I say Jesus is Lord of my life, what does that mean? Jesus is Lord of what I spend. Jesus is Lord of what I withhold. Jesus is Lord of who I love. Jesus is Lord of the people I choose to hate. Jesus is Lord of everything I do or don't do. That's harder to live with. Now, remember in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, all the times that God says to them, "Uh -uh, uh-uh, uh-uh, as soon as you forget, that everything you have is from my hand. I'm going to let you go the way that you go, and you will not prosper. And this is the accounting of that. This is a story about Jesus at the last judgment, isn't it? When he returns after a long time, he'll say to people, what have you done with what I've given you? And we will be expected to return the investment. Do you have any investors here? Anybody have stock in the stock market here? I'm sure some of you do. But a lot of you don't. Maybe you're afraid to take a risk. How many of you watch Jeopardy? We'll start with the easy one. How many watch Jeopardy? Do you like it when they say, let's make this a true daily double? Do you like that? Or how many of you think, ha, we're going to see what happens to you now? How many of you think it's a little arrogant to bet it all? So do you enjoy it when they get it right, or do you enjoy it more when they get it wrong and they lose all their money and they can't play Final Jeopardy? We're asked to invest, aren't we? Are we asked to invest what God gives us? 
Now that comes with the financial resources we talk about, and this is exactly the definition of a steward, which is the root of stewardship. A steward is someone who cares for somebody else's stuff. And these are slaves who are entrusted with a tremendous amount of money. They're, they're called to be stewards of what they've been given, just as we're called to be stewards of everything God gives us. But I keep saying to you every week, it's not about money. Stewardship is not just about money. It is about money because it's part of what we have from God. It's part of what we've been given, right? Everything we have is from God's loving hand. But it's about more than that. And how do we know that? Because we read the Old Testament lesson this morning, that lovely passage. If you know any part of Micah, this is what you know. What shall I return to the Lord? Well, that was the call to worship from the psalm. What shall I return to the Lord for all his bounty to me? It's returning. It's not what shall I give of what I have. It's what shall I return to God that already belongs to God. But if we look at Micah, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? That was what the law required, right? If you sinned, you went before God, you made your burnt offering to get your forgiveness. The sacrificial system. Then it goes on with calves a year old. That would have knocked a lot of folks out. We don't understand that, do we? Calves a year old, that was the gift of a very wealthy person. So already people are going, uh-oh, uh-oh, if I have to come before God with a calf and I can't afford a calf, what do I do? Then the Annie gets up some. Will you be pleased with thousands of rams? The king of Israel probably didn't have thousands of rams. Maybe thousands of sheep, but thousands of rams. That's an incredible amount of wealth there. With tens of thousands of rivers of oil. I've said to you before so many times, oil was a very precious commodity, which is why when the lights went out at night, when the sun went down, you know what you did? You didn't turn on the television. You didn't crank up the lights. You went to sleep because it was dark. There wasn't much else to do in the dark because to light a candle or an oil lamp was a very precious thing. So tens of thousands of rivers of oil. Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? No, God is not asking for human sacrifice, which some of the other religions of the era were doing in order to propitiate their God. You know, the throwing the virgin in the volcano, that's propitiation. That's warding off punishment by giving some huge gift to the deity in question. God's not asking that of us, although God will give God's only son for our sake, not for God's sin, but for the sins of the world. He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. To do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with your God. This is what's required of us. This is what we're supposed to give back to God. Salvation, though, we treat as an individual thing, don't we? You know, I've said the phrase that pays so many times is, I have accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. There are some people who will say you are not saved unless you say it in those words. But that's very individualistic, isn't it? Instead of God came to redeem all of humankind in Jesus Christ. That was God's aim in giving the Son so that we all might be before God and be made whole and be forgiven, be made free, be made new. That's what we're talking about here. Salvation is not something that we say, ooh, I'm in. The rest of you are on your own. Thank God for saving me. The only thing I don't like about Amazing Grace, how sweet this sounds, saved a wretch like me, the rest of you, I'm not sure about, but God saved me. We are called to share all that we have been given, and you share salvation by bringing others to God. You share the love of God by loving other people. You share the grace of God by showing it to others. You forgive as you've been forgiven. You let people know what it is to be part of the family and part of the church and part of the beloved community of God. Or you get scared and you hide it in the yard. People get scared, don't they? Let me tell you how pastors get scared. You know how pastors get scared and bury what God's given them in the yard? By being afraid to preach things people don't want to hear. You know, I know a lot of things that you all don't like to hear. I can tell when you don't have your masks on, especially because you give me sort of these looks like, hmm. People don't like to hear about stuff, do they? One of those things being racism. Now, I can see your eyes roll when I say that over top of your mask. It's because people don't want to hear about racism or critical race theory or things like that because they think that means I need to feel guilty the rest of my life and I need to be blamed for things I didn't do. That's not what it's about. But there are 
places where if you preach something that people don't want to hear, you know what they do? They take their money and they take their bodies and they leave the church and they go someplace else because they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. Several years ago, I was asked to write a piece for the conference newspaper. And I wrote a piece called The Diary of a Mad White Woman. I wrote out, crossed out the mad and wrote sad. I talked about all the incidents of racism that I had seen from the 60s through the present day in the church. Some in my own family, with cousins and other people. But one that really stuck me was when I was, it was the 1970s. I was in high school in the 1970s. I was in the youth group. I was very active in church. I sang in the choir. I was in the youth group. I did everything I could do in the life of the church in those days. We asked to go to Hershey Park. My parents, every Friday before school started, we went to Hershey Park together growing up. That was what we did. The last Friday before Labor Day, we went to Hershey Park. When the youth group asked to go, the youth group leader said, no, we can't go to Hershey Park. There are too many. And he said the N-word there. And he also referred to Pikesville as Kike Heights. I went to my pastor. I was 14 or 15 years old, and I said, you need to do something. And he said, I can't do anything about that. What do you want me to do? And I said, something. He said, but he's the treasurer of the church. They give a lot of money. I can't risk losing them. That's why I talk about racism, because things like that need to be shown to people. Because not to say that we're all racists or any of you are racists, but to say that together we're going to end it. This passage is a lot like flashlight tag. Anybody ever played flashlight tag? Somebody has a flashlight and they shine it on somebody, and when they hit somebody, you know what they do? They grab their hand and then they become part of the search party until everyone has joined together. That's what we're called to do as the body of Christ. That's what this passage is about, taking what God has given us and bringing others into the family, into the fold, and sharing it with them. It's not about us. It's about the world that God has given us, everything that God has given us. But if we bury it in the yard and get scared, we're never going to do a thing with it. Some of you know I'm a baseball fan. I'm more of a Baltimore Orioles fan because I really don't care about the What's it called? The World Series, right? I almost said Super Bowl. Wrong. The World Series, I don't care about these teams they are playing because I don't like the, the chop thing they do in, in Atlanta, and I don't like that other team at all. But you know what happens when you look at baseball statistics, and there are a lot of statistics in baseball. The people who hit the most home runs also have the greatest number of strikeouts. Why is that? Because they're swinging at something. Right? doesn't mean you swing at everything that comes by. But you've got to be willing to take the risk. You've got to be willing to take a risk if you ever want to accomplish anything. So we can take a risk with salvation. We can say to someone else, would you like to come to church with me on Sunday? They might look at you like you have 16 heads and 14 arms, and they might say, I don't do that. Or say to someone, do you need me to pray with you? Would you like me to pray for you? And mean it and do it. Or someone who hurt you, whether it was last week or 25 years ago, forgive them. Whether they are living or dead, forgive them because God in Christ has forgiven you and will give you the strength to do it and move beyond it to freedom. That's what we're called to do. It's a tough passage, isn't it? Because God wants us to share everything we have. Well, I did it with the kids. I'm going to do it with you now. Anybody want some money? It's not often do, that you have pastors hand out their own money, is it? Is it? I've done this in every church I've served, but I'll tell you what, the 9 o'clock service, nobody took a dime. They're like, uh-uh, I'm not going to do that. I gave the kids dollar bills. I got 50s, 20s, and 10s up here. And because nobody at the first service did it, we got twice as much to give out here. Swing. Swing at something. It's all going to go to the church. It's all going to go to mission. Who would like a $50 bill? Oh, come on. Take a risk. Somebody. I got two 50s up here. I got two 20s and two 10s. Who wants a 50? See what you can do with it. John, thank you. Come on up and get some money. Well done, good and faithful servant. By doing this, I'm not saying I'm God either. I don't want you to hear that. Because this money belongs to God. 
We'll see what John can do with it. And you have until the first Sunday of Advent to report back. Who wants the other 50? You're not going to let John get it over on you, are you? Come on, folks. Nobody else wants 50? Anybody want 20? Or 10? Heck, you could invest this in the bank and come back with 28 cents worth of interest after a year and a half. Nobody wants to try? How much, Judy? 20. Judy wants 20. Well done, good and faithful one. Anybody else want some? What do you want, Madeline? Yes, girl, yes. And look, he almost smiled at you. <laughs> Anybody else want some cash? Cold, hard cash? Let me tell you what happened when I did this in Frederick. I've told this story before, but some of you weren't here, so forgive me. I know I'm repeating myself. Church was going to take a mission trip to Jamaica. And you can see poverty on television. You can see it in a brochure, but it's not the same as seeing it in person. We went around a corner in our van. We were all laughing because we were just sort of together on the road going to the site where we were working. And we went around a corner, and there was a family on the side of the road living under a rusted mattress box spring with a half a tarp over it and cooking on a brick little children running around covered with flies. So we were going to go down there on the trip. We were raising money for the trip, and I did this in a church, and a man named Dean, we'll never forget Dean, took, I think it was 50 maybe. He was a firefighter in Montgomery County, professional firefighter. He went to Sam's Club with his $50, and he bought a bunch of boxes, those big boxes of potato chips, and he took them in put a sign on it and said, this is for my church for raising money. And he charged, I think, a dollar a bag. And people said, they're just going to take the money and they're going to take your chips and you're going to be left with nothing. But you know what happened? He went back every week and there was more money than he had asked for in the box. And he'd go back and he'd buy more chips. Did that for a couple of months. This went on probably about three or four months at that congregation. And then one day a guy came up to him and said, you got a Trinity United Methodist Church in Frederick, Maryland? He said, yes. And he said, because you know he's in Montgomery County working. He said, yeah, I live out there. Why? And he said, my kid was on a whitewater rafting trip recently, and their vans broke down. Your church sent vans to rescue him, wrote him a check for $100 right then and there to the church. But that wasn't the amazing thing. The amazing thing, people said to him, you go to church? Tell me about your church. Tell me why you go to church. Tell me what you believe. And then somebody one day said, would you pray for me? He said, I'll certainly pray for you. And then someone said to him one day, will you pray with me? Dean said he had never prayed out loud with another human being before, but he held the guy's hands and he was shaking because he was so upset because someone in his family was very sick. And his faith took fire. It took root. It went crazy after that. And he came in with $1,200 from a $50 bill. And when it came time to go to Jamaica, we said, Dean, you want to go with us? Because he didn't have the money to go. He said, I would feel bad taking his spot on the trip because I don't know how to do anything. I don't have any talent. I had a licensed contractor with me, a licensed electrician, and a licensed carpenter, plumber with me. And I said, Dean, I think you've earned a place on this trip. And he went along, and the plans that we had fell through for where we were supposed to work. We ended up working in an orphanage with three-year-olds and under. Dean had five children, and the oldest was 10 years old. He was the most skilled person we had. Because we got out of the van every day, and children would climb our bodies and cling to us, wanting to be held and loved. They couldn't afford diapers, so nobody was dressed from the waist down. And things just sort of flew everywhere. And how they fed the kids, they put them on a bench, five or six at a time. One of the matrons would take one bowl of oatmeal and put a spoon in each mouth. Dean was great. He was the best help we had because he knew how to manage five children at one time. Anybody want to take some more money after hearing that? Take a swing, folks. You may not hit anything. You may come back, and as one person did that day, 
when I called him to come up, she said, I forgot to invest the money. She said, I guess that's biblical, but she gave me an extra 10 out of her purse. I had another person who was a Mary Kay lady. She invested in one product and kept selling it, selling it, selling it. The more she told people about what she was doing with it, the more people bought because people want to do something good in the world. And you may be the reason they see God. So what do I have up here? I have $40. If you don't do anything with it, I will. I'll spend it myself, and we'll see what we come up with. First Sunday of Advent, all right? We're going to come back. But I want you, if you hear nothing else this morning, it's not about the money. It's about what we do with what God has given us. It's about recognizing that God is the source of all that we have, ever hope to have, and ever will be or hope to be. That comes from God's loving hand and grace. So whether you take $20 or $10 or $50 or no dollars at all, invest what God has given you in the rest of the world, and the world will change. And the money's going to follow, because where our heart is is where our treasure is. We read that a few weeks ago. Amen? Amen. Let's stand.